Good morning and welcome to the Saga PLC preliminary results for the year ended 31st January 2024 presentation. Throughout this recorded meeting, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted anytime via the QA tab situated in the right hand corner of your screen. Just click QA, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Mike Hazel, CEO. Good morning, sir. Morning, everybody. My name is Mike Hazel. I'm the group CEO, and I'm joined today by Mark Watkins, our group CFO. Welcome to Saga's full year results for the year ended January 2024. Firstly, before I go into any detail, I'd like to draw out <clears throat> some key threads that I'll cover off with more detail as we go through this presentation. Taking the year as a whole, we've achieved a fantastic set of results successfully delivering a profit outturn that is more than double that of the prior year and ahead of expectations. Strong cash generation has also resulted in a significant reduction in net debt, which fell by around 75 million pound over the year. This has been driven by strong performances in our cruise and travel businesses, where customer demand for our unique offering has translated into a significant increase in profits. This year, we have placed a renewed focus on our money business increasing the number of products we have on offer to those customers and establishing a foundation for growth in the future. Our insurance broking business continue to be hindered by challenging market conditions. This has impacted our competitiveness and in turn the number of policies we sold. We understand the drivers of this performance and we have taken action to address it. We're encouraged by the recent performance of our insurance underwriting business, which, having applied material price increases over the past 18 months, is now on a much stronger footing. We've also moved towards a leaner operating model, delivering £12 million of in-year cost efficiencies, supported by our decision to exit some smaller loss-making activities. All of this has been delivered alongside further progress in our customer and data strategy. We're focused on growing our customer numbers and deepening the connection with those customers. And we've made great strides in this area. To support our strategic objectives, we're also accelerating our Capital Light partnership strategy. I believe that the right partnerships in the right areas can amplify our growth ambitions and reduce our debt. We've previously spoken about potential partnership opportunities for Ocean Cruise. We're now also considering similar partnership opportunities across our insurance businesses. Meanwhile, our money business is fundamentally already based on a partnership model. I'll present more detail on these partnerships later. When I joined Saga last year, I had clear views about the strength of the business and the brand. Since then, those opinions have only strengthened. And it's clear to me that Saga is a business with solid foundations in place, a trusted brand, brilliant colleagues, and a large and loyal customer base. Across the group, we have a database containing 9.6 million customers, covering a significant proportion of our target over 50s demographic. It is this wealth of data and insight that has driven performance across each of our core businesses. Cruise was the standout performer this year with our boutique ocean and river offers continuing to resonate with our customer base. Load factors and per diems were materially up in ocean cruise and both revenue and passenger numbers in our river cruise operations grew significantly. We'll see later on that bookings for the year ahead are also progressing strongly. In travel, Increased passenger numbers driven by changes to our product set and improvements to our service efficiency meant that we returned to profitability for the first time since pandemic. Our money business is now well set for growth and we've worked with a number of expert partners to launch a series of new and well-received products. Challenging conditions in insurance have resulted in further decline, impacting both margins and policy numbers. I'll take you through some of the drivers of this shortly and the actions we're taking to address them. It's important that we strike the right balance between short term profitability and market competitiveness, the latter being the key to driving customer volumes ultimately necessary for long term sustainable growth. 
we are already seeing the early signs that the actions we are taking to rebalance that business are having the desired effect. And I'll now hand to Mark to talk through some financials. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to spend the next uh, few slides covering the financial results for the group for the year ended 31st of January 2024. And I'll also cover the outlook for the year ahead. As, as you can see, we've delivered a strong set of results for the year with an improvement across all of the key metrics. Underlying PBT under both the previous IFRS 4 and the current IFRS 17 is more than double 22-23. This reflects positives from ocean cruise performance beating our guidance, significant growth across river cruise and travel, and lower central costs. However, these were partially offset by a lower result from insurance. The group's loss before tax is materially lower than in the prior year, but still reflects some exceptional and one-off items that sit below the line. The most material of these one-off items is an insurance goodwill impairment of £104.9 million, reflecting the impact of historical action to focus on value. In addition to this, there was a restructuring costs of £40.3 million, arising from the move to a leaner operating model, the exit of some of our smaller loss-making activities, and the rationalization of our property portfolio. Significant growth in available operating cash flow of 88.9 million pounds was driven by the underlying trading result and a positive one-time benefit from river cruise and travel, moving to a 70% escrow arrangement in the first half of the year. The significantly improved cash flow drove continued deleveraging with a 74.5 million pound reduction in net debt and together with an improved trading EBITDA, leverage fell from 7.5 times to 5.4 times. Now turning to the now turning to the profit contribution from each of our business units. Our cruise and travel businesses delivered a strong result with 40 million pounds of underlying PBT returning to profit for the first time since the end of the pandemic. This has been possible because of the high level of demand from our customers, particularly in our ocean cruise business. <coughs> our insurance businesses have had a challenging time. Underlying claims inflation has had a profound impact on both our broking and underwriting businesses, with the impact being particularly felt across our three-year fixed price products in home and motor. Other businesses return to profit following the exit of some of our smaller <clears throat> loss activities and central costs, as I mentioned earlier, reflect significant savings following the efficiency <clears throat> from the move to a leaner operating model, which was delivered in the second half of last year. Pre Presented here is the expected organic deleveraging profile across the next couple of years. The range of expected outcomes is presented by the shaded area at the top of each bar. Debt reduction remains the group's number one priority. 23-24 benefited from some one-time cash positives, and we expect 24-25 to return to a more normal cash generation profile with an expected further reduction in net debt, even in a downside scenario. We expect to repay the £150 million bond maturing in May through a combination of available cash and the £85 million uh, loan facility from Roger DeHaan. As we continue with our deleveraging plans, we are grateful for the continued support from Roger, who recently extended the maturity of his facility to April 2026. This change provides us with a runway to fully explore the partnership op op opportunities that Mike mentioned briefly. So what, 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 what do we expect from the year ahead? We expect to see continued growth in ocean crews as we continue to maximise the load factor and per diems, which after a certain point drop through entirely to the bottom line. This will lead to growth in revenue, EBITDA, and underlying PBT. 
In River Cruise, the introduction of our new ship, Spirit of the Duro, last month means we're, we, we also expect continued growth here. As a rough guide, each of our new river ships is expected to generate an incremental one to one and a half million pound underlying PBT per year. Growth in passenger numbers and revenue is expected to continue in travel, su supporting a significant increase in underlying PBT. However, the challenges in insurance are expected to continue, at least in the short term. We are taking steps to stabilize the business and ultimately return insurance to growth. This, this means that we are entering a transitional period with lower motor and home broking margins as we invest in price to slow the decline in policy sales. In the short term, we expect to be materially lower at an underlying PBT level uh, than 23-24. Insurance underwriting is now on a significantly stronger footing, having applied this, the price increases over the past 18 months. As these continue to flow through, we expect to drive a return to profitability and a reduction in the combined operating ratio. The outcome of all of this is that we expect group underlying PBT to, to be broadly flat year on year, with growth in cruise and river offsetting the lower insurance outlook, and of course, a continued reduction in net debt. And with that, I'll hand you back to Mike. Thanks, Mark. So we've said that we're taking action in our insurance business to stabilize that business and then return it to growth. So I just wanted to pause um, on insurance for a, for a moment. So kicking off on insurance, taking a step back, I wanted to reiterate the clear underlying strengths of Saga Insurance. At its heart, Saga Insurance is a profitable business with a number of clear and differentiating attributes. These attributes set us apart from our competition in the over 50s market and provide the basis for future opportunities. Key to this is the fundamental strength of the Saga brand amongst our loyal over 50s customer base with whom we have a retention rate of over 81% in motor and home and more than 88% prompted brand awareness across the group. This is supported by our significant group customer database of 9.6 million customers, 6.9 million of which we are able to contact about our insurance products. In addition, we know that Saga customers do not shop on price alone, and we offer products that differentiate us from our competitors. For example, our three-year fixed price products account for 41% of our motor book and 51% of our home book, and our travel and private medical products include product features which reflect our insight into the needs of our target customer segments. In insurance broking, we have a strong distribution network, ensuring more than 1.5 million customers. As for underwriting, we're now on a much stronger footing, having repriced our portfolio and implemented claims cost reduction actions. Our underwriting and pricing capabilities enable us to tailor our risk selection and net pricing to reflect the over 50s target market. And of course, all of these attributes are brought together by the focus on service from our colleagues who cater for the very specific requirements of our customer base. Given the much improved position and outlook for our underwriting business, I'm gonna focus the next few slides on our insurance broking business and the actions that we're taking to address some of the challenges we've seen in that business. While Saga has very clear points of differentiation, our insurance broking business has been affected by the specific and well-publicized issues that the industry has faced over the past two years. The FCA's regulatory changes introduced in January 2022 led to a reduction in our price competitiveness. In addition, from the second half of 2022, the exceptionally high inflation in motor claims experienced across the market was passed on to us in net rate increases. Moreover, our margins were further impacted by three-year fixed product by our three-year fixed product, which were unable to, we were unable to reprice during the fixed period. 
we were also reduced our marketing spend and held back our investment plans to manage our short-term profitability. Against this backdrop, our strategy has been to maintain a disciplined approach to retail pricing to protect margins in the short term. As the charts show on the right, this has had the effect of reducing our customer and policy numbers, as well as our profitability. This left us with a reduced customer and policy base to manage alongside a relatively fixed cost base. Before I talk about the actions that we're taking to address these challenges, I wanted to talk you through the impact of our three-year fixed price policies, which is key to our portfolio. Our three-year fixed price motor and home policies introduced in 2019 were introduced in 2019 ahead of the, the FCA changes and are a prime example of how we differentiate ourselves within a commoditized market. These products resonate well with our demographic who are less likely to buy on price alone and value the price certainty along with peace of mind and the value of Saga service. However, it is a product which has been significantly impacted by the inflationary and regula regulatory backdrop I've described. As this chart shows, the business we wrote in early 2021 was adequately priced when looking forward across the period of the fixed price. As inflation increased beyond expected levels, new policies were underpriced as inflation far exceeded expectations in the following years. And this affected some business written in the latter half of 2021 and through 2022. Looking at where we are now with three year fixed, much of the pressure on margins from that inflationary impact is now starting to reduce. New and refixed policies are being repriced with prudent inflation assumptions. And as we've referenced before, we expect all of the policies that were written pre-inflation to have been fully repriced by the middle of next year. We've been prudent in our inflation assumptions, and while there, be, there will be some profit drag in 24-25, the easing pressure on margins has given us the headroom to take action on pricing to stabilize the insurance business. So why are we shifting our focus to protecting our scale as well as our margins now? The short answer is that a change of approach would not have been possible before now. During a very volatile period, we made the decision to protect short term profitability. However, now that we're beginning to see some stability emerging in the market, it's right that we begin to focus on the longer term outlook and take decisions to recover the volumes that were lost during this volatile period. Given the improving market conditions, we've begun to observe in motor pricing and the easing pressure on three-year fixed price margins, now is the right moment, moment for us to change approach and begin to rebalance protection of our margins for customer growth. We're now focused on this longer term view, switching our approach to one in which we focus even more on protecting existing customers by improving our competitive position so that we can then grow customer numbers and ensure the sustainability of the business. With this, our approach is split in two parts. Firstly, short-term stabilization, and then preparing for growth in the longer term. On short-term stabilization, we have over the past few months taken clear steps to steady the business. Primarily, we have taken pricing action in broking across all our products, and particularly in motor and home, to sharpen our competitive position. This not only protects our existing business, but it also stimulates new business, which in time will slow the decline in policy sales. To date, the impact of these changes is tracking in line with our expectations, with improvements seen across conversion, retention and margin. So it's working. We've also begun to increase our marketing spend and investing, in further, investing further in our marketing tools to more effectively target customers. This has led to increasing lead volumes aligned to our marketing spend efficiency and short term payback targets. In addition, we remain focused on keeping a tight control of costs across our operations and non operational functions. We also remain focused on offering differentiated products 
and will be launching a new travel product shortly designed to meet the specific needs of our customer group in the second quarter. Finally, continued development of our partnerships across all of our products remains a key part of our insurance plans. We've worked closely with Collinson to develop our new travel product. And you may recall that we recently partnered with Bupa for private medical insurance. We also extended our relationship with Aegeus, who now partner with us for motor and home insurance. If I now move on to preparing the business for longer term growth, our focus is very clearly on scaling the business. And as part of this, we're exploring further options for partnership models in insurance. This is consistent with our group strategy to move towards a capital light business model and follows the move to explore similar partnership arrangements in Ocean Cruise. We believe this will enable us to improve the efficiency of our customer service while at the same time crystallizing value, reducing debt and enhancing long term shareholder returns. There are clearly a range of options available, and while it is too early to comment on any particular avenue, we will keep you updated as we progress. So to conclude on insurance, the actions that we're taking are absolutely the right actions and we're taking them at the right time. The easing margin pressure on our three year fixed policies gives us the headroom to make these changes and we are already seeing encouraging signs that this is working. While we are entering a transitional period with lower profitability in the near term, the rebalancing of price and margin to grow the customer base is necessary for short term stability and long term sustainability. Looking further ahead, I'm confident for the future prospects of cyber insurance, which includes the exploration of potential partnership opportunities. Saga has an outstanding brand, a loyal customer base and a differentiated product set, leaving us well placed as we target future growth for our insurance business. As I mentioned earlier, Saga is a business with solid foundations in place. While this represents a good platform, our success lies in building on these fundamentals. I'm focused on achieving a clear vision for Saga to be the largest and most trusted brand for older people in the UK. To that end, we have tightened our strategic priorities to better deliver our growth plans while staying consistent with our previously stated goals. We'll maximize our core businesses, we'll reduce our debt through capital light growth, and we will grow our customer base and deepen the relationships that we have with those customers. Now, taking each of these in turn. We've covered a lot of the more quantitative progress that made across each of our businesses. However, it's important to also focus on some of the broader achievements and successes this year. In Cruise, not only have we delivered excellent financial results, but our customer satisfaction measured through Transactional Net Promoter Score, or TNPS, increased by 16 points, reflecting particularly the improvements made to our river cruises. Building on the strong demand for our river cruises, we are continuing to expand our river fleet with our third, part, third purpose built ship expected in 2025. Unlike our ocean cruise business, access to future river ships is not capital constrained. Apologies, I lost you for a moment there. Unlike our ocean cruise business, Access to our river ships is not capital constrained and is a significant growth opportunity as we go forward. In travel, our unique offering continues to be recognized industry wide, and we were proud to receive 28 wins at the recent British Travel Awards. We've also been making changes behind the scenes with the development and launch of a new website that brings all of our products into one place, together with investment in our contact centers that enable us to service a greater volume of inquiries that ultimately translate to increased sales. Together with our fantastic 
customer proposition, these improvements have been key to the significantly improved travel performance this year. In insurance, we've been equally busy. As well as supporting new partnerships with Bupa for PMI and Aegeus for our motor panel, we've navigated regulatory change, improved our fraud detection capabilities and continued to enhance our operating systems. We've already set out in detail what 2425 looks like in our insurance update a moment ago, but fundamentally it's about positioning the business for long-term growth and partnerships will be an important part in amplifying that growth. Finally, we've made great progress in positioning Saga money for growth. Alongside the launch of new products that I mentioned earlier, we've also developed a new website and continue to grow our sector leading TMPS, which now stands at 72 compared to 64 in the previous year. I see great potential in this relatively immature area of our business and we'll continue to build customer awareness around these great products and potential new products in the future that uniquely serve the needs of our customers. Success for Saga need not be capital intensive, and we remain focused on adopting capital light strategies wherever it makes sense to do so. Not only will this approach enable Saga to significantly reduce its debt, but it will allow us to more fully leverage the Saga brand and drive future growth. Our money business is already a substantially partner-led model, successfully leveraging the Saga brand and customer base into a broad range of personal finance products delivered via specialist partnerships. We believe there are partnership opportunities elsewhere in our business to support our strategic plans. In Cruise, we are continuing to explore partnership opportunities for our ocean business. We have an incredibly popular customer offer and our two ships are now nearing capacity. It is therefore right for us to consider options that would harness this success introduce reduce capital intensity and open the path to future capacity to satisfy ongoing strong demand while we are taking action in insurance to stabilize and then grow that business there remain long-term opportunities within our value chain to draw on partner capabilities and infrastructure to support our growth ambitions again deliverable through capital light means consistent with our deleveraging strategy it is by no means certain that we will ultimately pursue any of these opportunities and indeed it is unlikely we would need or want to pursue all of them. Each opportunity is therefore being reviewed in terms of its fit with our strategic objectives and the quality of the potential partnerships available. Once we have considered these opportunities, we'll choose the path that best supports our strategic priorities and delivers the greatest shareholder value. <coughs> Customers are at the heart of Saga, and we've built our business on understanding those customers and meeting their needs. Continuing to deep, deepen our relationship with customers has been a real focus for us this year and will be a key driver of future growth. We get great feedback from our customers and exceptional loyalty. As you can see, on average, we have an astonishing 13 year relationship with our customers and this is even higher at 17 years with our most loyal cohort. Maximizing the volume and the quality of data we hold on this group allows us to better understand and ultimately serve their unique needs. As a reminder, we already have around 10 million people over 50 on our database. And while there are 26 million older people in the UK, this represents around 77% of our target market. There is a real opportunity to broaden our reach and convert even more of these individuals into regular customers with more frequent engagement. Our website is, of course, one way of doing this, and we've recently developed functionality that allows more than 15 million visitors to the website each year to sign up for email updates, providing interesting articles and offers across a range of our products. The Saga magazine is also a fantastic asset and something that I'm sure you will have all heard of. With over 120,000 subscribers and an industry leading retention rate of over 80%, our customers love it. Alongside this, 
we are bringing the successful elements of exceptional Salva Exceptional into our core publishing business, including our weekly digital newsletters. These provide relevant and insightful content across a range of travel, money and magazine topics. When combined, these newsletters reach more than 1.2 million subscribers each week. While frequency of engagement is important, we're also focused on enhancing the quality and depth of our customer interactions. Our customers are very engaged with our content and our email marketing activity benefits from strong opening rates with over two thirds being read and our relatively new newsletter strategy is already delivering opening rates in excess of 50%. To further complement the success of our magazine and newsletters, next month we are launching a new magazine website within saga.uk that will provide more fantastic content to our readers, creating a single hub for our customers to meet a range of their lifestyle needs. We expect this to drive further customer engagement and increase the traffic to our website. All of this with the objective of understanding our customers more, deepening our engagement with them, enabling us to better deliver products and services that meet their needs. I just wanted to pause on this page for a moment, just to highlight the fantastic work that our magazine colleagues do. It's a fantastic product. And those of you that haven't had a look, I recommend that you do. So to wrap up, this has been a year of progress in which we have more than doubled our profitability and further reduced our debt. Our cruise and travel businesses have performed particularly strongly and continue to generate high levels of demand. In insurance, we're tracking, we're tackling the challenging market conditions and have a plan that will stabilize the business and lay the foundations for future growth. And it's already beginning to bear fruit. Meanwhile, the work we are doing across money and publishing businesses and in data places in a good position to extend our customer reach and leverage our brand. We are exploring several partnership opportunities and believe these could support us in driving our business forward and contribute to our debt reduction objectives. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues for their continued hard work and support and our customers for their ongoing loyalty. I've met a lot of our customers in my short time here and they really are a special group. And I'm very proud of what Saga means to them. I remain confident that we have the right strategy, a powerful brand and a compelling set of products and services. And these things will deliver our long-term strategic success. We'll now move to questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions just using that Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. I'd now like to hand you over to Emily Roth, Head of Investor Relations to host the Q&A session. Emily, if I could ask you to please read out the question uh, and uh, direct it to the team, I'll just bring your cameras up mm -hmm. and uh, that will be great. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. We've had a few questions on the group's debt position, so perhaps if we start with those. David H asks, given the bond market is currently open again and your implied cost of debt, given the 26 bonds trade at around 90, is circa 10%, do you expect to be able to refinance those bonds with a new issuance? Mark, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, so uh, as 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 we've said, we we, we intend to repay the May twenty twenty four bond uh, from available cash and drawing on Roger de Haan's facility. I think when it comes to uh, the Roger de Haan facility and the twenty twenty six bond, um, I, th I think we are exploring a number of options. Um, that that includes uh, some of the partnership um, activity that Mike has talked about, talked about, um, but given that we are uh, a couple of years away from the maturity of, of those uh, debt, debt instruments, um, it, it's too early to say what we would intend to do. Um, but I think uh, if you look at the cash flow and the performance of the business, I think I think we're com confident that we have, um, we would be able to have a solution for, for the refinancing of those. Yeah, just to just to build on that a little bit. Um, look, we've, we've put out a strong set of results today 
profits um, very strong, <clears throat> generating a lot of cash flow. And so we continue to delever and reduce our debt. That puts us in a good position to both repay the near term debt, um, but also head towards uh, the repayment or refinancing of that 2026 uh, maturity. Over and above that, the partnership opportunities that we're exploring um, will give us greater opportunity to improve cash flows and further reduce debt. So all those things combined, as Mark says, um, to put us in a good place as we consider what our options are um, as we head towards 2026. Thank you. Ignatius P asks, debt is still very high. How long do you think you need to bring down the net debt to zero? I don't think, uh, well, I think my answer a moment ago probably covers a lot of that ground, um, but we don't necessarily need to bring net debt down to zero. We just need to bring it down to a sustainable level. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing through the ongoing deleveraging that we've got. Um, and we think that uh, the partnership opportunities can help us accelerate that um, and build on the, the great progress we're already making. Thank you. Matthew T asks, what is the absolute level of debt you are aiming for to be able to successfully refinance the 26 bond? If you need to make assumptions on EBITDA alongside this, please do, but please do not provide debt to EBITDA ratios because there is some ambiguity around whether this does or does not include the cruise debt. Uh, we're not going to guide to a specific um, EBITDA um, or debt level, the two interplay together. Mark, feel free to comment in a, in a moment. Um, but what I'd suggest is that uh, the performance of the business, um, both at a profit level and a cash level, puts us in a very good position as we head over the next couple of years um, to refinance uh, in a sensible way. And the partnership opportunities that we're exploring um, will only help us um, in that progress. Is there anything you'd want to add to that, Mark? No, no nothing, nothing to add. Thank you. Stephen Kay had a similar question, but also asked, how do you anticipate balancing debt reduction with capital allocation for new initiatives and growth? Uh, well, we're doing that all the way through. Um, so I think if you we've been operating in, in frankly, a capital constrained um, environment over the last 12 months, it hasn't stopped us delivering strong profitability and continuing to reduce our, our debt. So our plans do strike the balance between ongoing deleveraging but continuing to grow um, our business. And you'll see um, the decisions we've taken in insurance um, are exactly that, taking long-term decisions to reinvest um, in the competitiveness in our insurance um, business um, whilst continuing to drive uh, debt in the right direction with the long-term view of sustainability. Thank you. Another shareholder asks, it is clear that the investment in price for insurance will generate a significant cost for shareholders, but it is less obvious what the benefit for shareholders will be. Please explain what benefits are expected to arise from this material planned investment. Okay, well, uh, I'll take a step back and just try and explain why we're, why we're taking this decision um, and, and why we're doing it now. So what we've seen over the past couple of years is significant volatility, particularly in insurance broking. Um, and during that period of volatility, we've had to protect short term profitability, um, not least because our overall group profits were also um, under pressure. As we come out of that period of volatility with profits recovering, um, it's right that we look at the long term implications um, of the actions that we've taken so far. So over the last couple of years, whilst we have protected short term profits, um, we have um, uh, the, the, the short term profit actions have continued to drive volumes down. Uh, and you'll see from uh, the presentation that we made earlier in the week that we've uh, announced a 9% decline in volumes in insurance. Now, sooner or later, we have to stop the decline uh, in volumes and address our competitiveness. So the actions that we're taking um, to reinvest in the insurance competitiveness will mean that we can stabilize that volume decline that will ultimately lead to long-term profit growth. If we don't take the actions to stabilize uh, and increase our competitiveness, then the volume declines will continue and volume declines continuing on a fixed cost base that is how an insurance business operates um, will lead to ongoing decline in profitability. So this is the right moment to pause address our competitiveness and then rebuild for growth. Uh, overall, uh, our profitability at a group level remain um, broadly flat year on year, uh, and then we can expect growth to, to come through after that. 
Thank you. Matthew T asks, all else being equal, once the full runoff on badly priced three year insurance contracts have rolled off and newly priced contracts roll in fully, what is the forecast impact on broking margins? Uh, we're not guiding to specific margins, but you can see the overall shape um, uh, and the impact that three year fixed has had and the positive uh, impact it'll have going forward. Overall, the way to look at um, the impact on margins together with the actions we're taking uh, to redress uh, to address competitiveness is um, the there are a number of moving parts without giving specific guidance so if we take our travel business we've guided that that will continue to grow and drive profits upwards in those businesses uh, that growth in profitability there will be offset by a decline in profitability in the current year for insurance so you can roughly gauge how much of a profit decline in insurance is going to come through if it's offsetting the growth that we're seeing in, in travel and um, cruise this year. Um, if you add into that um, a stabilisation of volumes, then you start to get a rough idea as to um, where the, the margin impact or the rough quantum of the margin impact will be. But we haven't given any public guidance beyond that. Thanks, Mike. Andrew B asks, your insurance business is at a cyclical low in profitability. Why is it the right time to seek a partner? Does it reflect that the company is in a particularly tight corner? So just standing back on what we're doing with um, partnerships, um, the, we believe there are strategic partnerships, um, opportunities across uh, a number of our business areas. And the objective of those partnership discussions will be to amplify our strategy um, and draw on partner capabilities where it makes sense to do so do so to um, scale our business uh, and deliver efficiencies. Um, we also expect in some of those opportunities to um, uh, for there to be the opportunity to raise capital. Now, how and where we do that and in what fashion, um, that remains to be seen because these are, we are just exploring a range of options at the moment. But we do expect, um, and indeed um, the criteria will be, that these discussions deliver strategic um, we'll deliver on our strategic ambitions, help us scale, deliver efficiencies, um, but we do expect there to be a release of capital somewhere um, across these um, options because um, with, there's plenty of capital tied up there and uh, efficiency opportunities um, uh, across the way. Thanks, Mike. Um, still on partnerships, Bobby F asks, please could you give us an example of the type of partnership agreement and how it might work? In the cruise business, a sale and lease back would mean foregoing present fixed low cost funding for something considerably more expensive. How would that make financial sense? Okay, well, I'm not going to talk specifically about um, what the opportunities across ocean um, and insurance might be because there are a myriad of different opportunities and we're deliberately exploring, exploring all of them with the criteria that um, it they meet our strategic ambitions but also deliver shareholder value but if you want a, a good example of how um, we already work well with partners um, then uh, you can look at our money business which is a partner-led business um, our our savings pl uh, product for example um, is a very successful partner-led savings product we've recently launched um, a, a savings platform with a company called flagstone that enables our customers to um, invest their savings um, very efficiently across multiple different financial institutions and then every, well, as much as regularly as they would like, um, reinvest and move their funds around so that they can always achieve the greatest um, return on their savings. Um, another example is the um, probate and legal services that we've just launched with uh, Co-op where we provide great legal services under the Saga brand, um, but the back office function is delivered via co-op. So we bring our brand, um, but we share on partner capabilities and infrastructure um, in, in a, uh, so we get the best of both worlds. So we bring our large and loyal customer base um, and share it with the expertise and infrastructure of um, a third party partner. So there are many, many different ways in which we can leverage our brand, um, drive growth, and do what Saga does best, which is um, put great products in front of um, our large and loyal customer base. Thanks, Mike. 
Matthew T asks, last year you mentioned that you had plans in place to sell the old headquarters and other properties amounting to proceeds of approximately 30 million pounds. Did the property sales happen? So we have restructured our property portfolio um, and those properties are on the market, um, but we haven't got any more update to give at this point. Thank you. Matthew T asks, you mentioned that restructuring costs included property sales. So I assume if they were sold, the restructuring costs were some 30 million pounds more than you stated. Can you please provide an approximate breakdown of the various elements of the restructuring costs and guidance on how much restructuring costs are likely to come through in 24, 25 and 25, 26 and beyond? I'm not quite sure that statement's correct, but Mark, perhaps you can just give a bit of color on restructuring costs. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so we incurred forty million of restructuring costs. Um, they, they, they did not include any um, offsetting profits from from the property disposal. So, so, so we incurred forty million pounds of um, restructuring costs in the year. Now, a, a large portion of that related to the restructurings that that we did during the year, specifically the one we did at the end, uh, well, in the second half of last year to, to move the central cost functions to a, to a leaner model. Um, but it also included uh, the costs of closing some of our smaller loss making activities as, as well. Um, in terms of the go forward position, um, while, while we don't expect the same level of restructuring costs, um, we, we, we would you know, we, we would expect to incur a, um, you know, a, a small number of restructuring costs probably in both in both years looking forward. Thanks, Mark. Christian R asks how are price rises in cruises being taken by Saga's customers? I'm sorry, I was, <laughs> I was distracted. Can you repeat that question? Sure. So Christian R asks, how are price rises in cruise being taken by Saga's customers? Um, okay, it's important to understand the context of price rises in cruise, um, because what we're doing every year is putting more into the proposition and delivering great value to our customers. Um, and those customers are proven very willing to pay, um, for, pay extra for those services. Uh, the other thing that is happening is that the, the ships are now rapidly filling up and there is a natural dis uh, supply and demand. And what we're seeing is customers are um, coming to us earlier and earlier um, to book their cruises um, because they want to be sure they can get on the ships and therefore they're willing to pay more and pay earlier um, because they, lo they love cruising with us uh, and with only two ships available to us um, that uh, obviously um, drives significant demand with that limited supply. Therein lies the opportunity uh, to partner with um, potential partners to hopefully open up routes to more capacity in the future and bring Saga cruising to even more um, customers as we go forward. Thanks, Mike. Andrew B asks, given the limited number of parties who are conceivable partners for the cruise business, is it reasonable to expect a conclusion relatively soon? Not going to give a, a clear timeline, um, but we said it's something that we're looking at um, at the moment. Uh, and you can expect this year to be the year where we make good progress on partnership discussions. But you'll have to allow us to do the work and then update you as and when we can. Thank you. Eamon S asked, what will the projected free, flat, free cash flow be in a normal cycle? Do you want to talk to that, Mike? Uh, Mark? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I, and, I th and I think it's probably just worth po pointing out um, slide uh, slide 15 in, in the results presentation that we that we presented yesterday, which shows which shows a bridge in um, net debt, but 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 also shows the available operating cash flows um, uh, as, as, as kind of constituent parts. There's probably some one offs to draw um out out of those numbers though so so the positive one-offs that we saw last year um was was a 10 million pounds um 10 million pounds um refund um from some of our bonding arrangements so so that was a positive 10 million pound inflow we also saw a positive 20 million pound inflow from moving our travel business to a 70% uh, ring fence from 100%. Um, and then we also saw a 14 million pound dividend from a, our insurance underwriting business. 
Now, those those those, those things are unlikely to reoccur um, in in this year. Offsetting those um, uh, clearly are the restructuring costs. Uh, we we had cash restructuring costs of twenty eight point eight million pounds. Um, and as I said uh, a, few, a few moments ago, we would not expect that same level of re cash restructuring costs to be incurred in this year as well. So, so we've had, we've got some positive one offs, but 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 also some uh, neg negative one offs. And and then and then broadly, I think um, we we would expect the cash the cash flow from the underlying operating businesses. Um, to, to broadly follow our guidance on underlying PBT. Thanks, Mark. Eamon S also asks, what is the anticipated EV to EBITDA for the full year 24-25? Can we guide on that, Mark? Uh, well, it, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be impossible to guide to that on uh, uh, EV is a is a is a me, is a metrics that's determined by our share price. Um, so so, so it, it is going to be it's going to be very difficult to guide on on something which is outside of our control. I think you can take your view on where the share price will end up. Uh, you can take our cash flow and profit um, projections and, and reach your own conclusions from there. Thank you. Um, we've had two similar questions from shareholders, one from AS, one from Ignatius P. Um, essentially, given the current share price, would management consider buying at the current levels? Okay, so look, at, I've only recently joined, but I think probably answer that question in a slightly different way. Um, I, I spend a lot of time talking to our shareholders um, and the starting point I take with those uh, investors is um, they have invested their capital in our business. My remuneration and the other directors' remunerations include share allocations over time that will vest depending on the performance of the business. So we are inherently um, tied to the shareholder performance. But let's be clear, um, I've just joined this business uh, and invested my career in this business as well. So. Um, trust me, I'm very incentivized um, for the success um, of this business, and I think our our overall remuneration being heavily tied towards um, share performance and future share allocation means uh, interests are very much aligned. Thanks, Mike. Andrew B asks: Is there scope to reduce the overhead base further? Will partnerships drive further overhead reductions? So we'll always be looking for opportunities to manage our business um, effectively. Um, so I wouldn't rule out um, finding further efficiencies. Um, partnerships are certainly a route where we believe there may be efficiency opportunities, but you'll need to let us do the work uh, to understand what those might look like uh, and whether whether that's possible. Thanks, Mike. Eamon S has two similar questions. One is, is Saga Money profitable? And the other is Saga Magazine profitable? So taking the first one, Saga Money, yes, Saga Money is profitable. Um, and having launched four new products, um, there is significant growth potential um, in that business. So it's profitable and we can expect a lot more profits to come uh, from that business. So that's certainly an exciting area for us, built off very low overheads um, and strong partnerships. Um, and Saga Magazine, yes, Saga Magazine is profitable, but um, actually to, to think about the profits of Saga Magazine, that's not the point. Uh, Saga Magazine um, is a really powerful route through which we can communicate to our customers um, and engage and drive and deepen relationships with them. What that leads to um, is greater conversion into sales. So actually, uh, I view Saga Magazine, whilst it's helpful that it is um, profitable, it is much more importantly a marketing channel for us to drive, um, be it through the physical magazine or through the new Saga magazine website that's being launched, drive traffic towards our businesses to drive future sales and customers that write, read the magazine, guess what? They love Saga and they tend to want to buy our products. Um, so the more magazine, um, the more magazines that get in people's hands, um, the greater the prospect that they'll then go on to buy products. So very much focused on driving that business, not for profit purposes, but for marketing purposes. Thanks, Mike. Matthew T has another question regarding debt. Investec currently have EBITDA estimates for 2026 at £130 million. Please, can you answer a straightforward question? 
if that level of EBITDA does materialise, where do you expect net debt will need to be to repay the 2026 bond? I don't, I don't think we can give any more guidance. We've already given on that, can we, Mark? No, no, I, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think we can. No, I think, I think we've, I think we've addressed the 26 bond in, in, in a num number of different ways. Thank you. Uh, one more question on properties from Eamon S. Did you sell any of the properties in the year and what was the value of this? Um, I'm trying to think of the timing. So most of the properties um, have been put up for sale and the process is running. Um, and I think we, we may be due to announce one of those shortly. Is that right, Mark? Yeah, we, we, we've, we've exchanged subject to planning um, on, on one of, on one of the um, on, on one of the properties, uh, the, the the proceeds would be the low single digit mil millions. Um, so, so so not 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 material to uh, not material to the overall balance sheet. But but by that you should read progress is being made. Thank you. Uh, there are no further questions. Okay, Good. Well, look. Um, thank you for your time, everybody. Just to summarise. Um, or Paul, are you going to hand back to me before I summarise? No, you, you please go ahead, Mike. Thank you very yeah, thank much. You. Um, look, we think we've delivered a great set of results. I'm very pleased with the performance this year. Uh, they set us well up for the year ahead. Uh, and I'm very excited to see where we can take this business, having created some foundations for growth um, over the past 12 months. So appreciate all of your support, everybody. Fantastic. Mike, Mark, Emily, thank you very much indeed for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session and should be automatically redirected to provide your feedback, nor do the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I know it's value, greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Saga PLC, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all. Thanks, everyone.